Uh, in the case of Osborne versus Winger, we're looking at a case of a drunk driver, uh, but not a criminal prosecution, a civil prosecution. Um, in this case, uh, Winger admitted that he was that he was at fault. He was he was drunk, had a blood alcohol level of 0.19, uh, which is almost twice twice the legal limit. And the question is is whether the jury was appropriately prevented from learning uh, that Winger was was insured, and and the. This case is a little more complicated than your ordinary case because there was also a lawsuit for, or part of the lawsuit was a claim for punitive damages. That because, because Winger was drunk, that, that the jury ought to punish him in the civil context for his intoxication. And, um, and so we learned then during the course of the lawsuit because, because with punitive damages, the, the amount of money that you uh, that you seek to get is regarded as obviously punishment, and if you if you punish you know Michael Bloomberg with a, a penalty of a million dollars, that's actually not that much money to Michael Bloomberg. If you punish me with a penalty of a million dollars, well, I'll, I'll never you know I'll never have a dime again. So so the 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 amount of money that you that you extract from a person as as part of punishment as an impunitive damages varies based on how much the person's actually worth. So in this case, because punitive damages were at issue, the jury got to learn that, that uh, the liable party, Winger, was, was not a very rich man at all. In fact, he was quite poor. And so, and so the, the plaintiff, uh, the person who was not drunk in this case, wanted to introduce evidence that he was insured so the jury wouldn't feel bad about about offering compensation, uh, and the compensation wouldn't be too low. Um, and so the court in this case does not allow uh, that information in, doesn't allow the, the the insurance coverage to come in because of because of of Rule 411. But the problem still remains about this punitive damages thing. Um, What's, how does all that play in? Because we've now still learned that this guy is very poor. And the court said that the, the problem was that if we had learned about the insurance coverage, that the jury who probably felt understandable sympathy for, for the victim in this case would have made the compensatory damages very high because they knew it was coming from the deep pocket insurance company rather from, than from the rather than from the civil defendant in this case. So what do we do about the punitive aspect of this? The fact that, the fact that we've learned that he was poor, um, the fact that that might drive the compensatory damages down unless they know that he's insured and can actually pay some judgment, that, that they may not want to impoverish this man for the rest of his life paying off this judgment. How is it that we keep from, from from the jury undercompensating uh, this this victim, and and um, the court says, in this case, that's not a concern, because the jury was instructed that it could only consider the defendant's wealth or lack thereof as part of the punitive damages award. That they were to disregard the fact that they knew that the defendant was really poor in in assessing compensatory damages. Now, this, is, this may be legal fiction and it may not. We just have no way of knowing if juries actually listen to instructions like this. And my guess is the answer is sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And we don't really know when and we have no way of, of figuring out when they do and when they don't. But whenever, whenever a court can't figure out a really good solution to something, one of the best answers they come up with is, well, we'll instruct the jury to ignore it. We'll instruct the jury that they're to disregard this. And so they do. Um, but, but if you remove the punitive damages question and the fact that we thereby learned about the, the fact that the defendant was poor, this would be a classic case of, of not allowing in insurance coverage. You don't want the jury knowing there's a deep pocket insurance coverage or a deep pocket insurance company out there because we're afraid that'll drive that'll drive the verdicts up. Here, it almost felt like we needed to tell them 
that there was something there because they have now learned about, about the defendant's poverty. And that probably will keep them from, from being willing to impose as much of a, of a judgment as they otherwise would under the compensation part. In some ways, this case may have been may have been mishandled by the by the plaintiff's lawyer. It may have been, I don't know enough about the facts to, to fully conclude this, but it may have been wise not to bring the punitive damages angle. It may have been wise not to thereby open up the defendant's lack of, of finances, finances um, because, because they weren't able to then bring in the insurance coverage. Um, that might have actually been a tactical mistake because now all the jury's left with is the defendant's a poor guy. And if we, if we render a really high, high verdict, uh, he may not be able to pay that and might be impoverished for the rest of his life. But the underlying, the underlying rule still, still applies. Um, you cannot bring in the fact that the defendant is insured um, as part of the trial for fear that, that, um, that will lead the jury to, a, to a, an inappropriately high verdict. Here, it might have led the jury to an inappropriately low verdict because of the, the plaintiff's lawyer's decision to actually make the defendant's wealth an issue by bringing punitive damages uh, as one of the claims.